Thanks for coming this morning. Kind of cool in here. It's, uh, my name is Gary Matsoka and this is Laguna Hills Nursery and today's subject is growing roses. So we'll be talking more about growing them than the varieties themselves, but of course we always have to mention why we grow roses. Uh, one of the reasons is they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so most of our customers, the people we deal with, grow the what are called the cutting roses, the absolutely gorgeous single flower roses. That's uh, Moonstone may be the top show rose at the moment. You know, you have a rose show and you exhibit your roses, and this one wins a lot of awards because of its, you know, just number of petals, shape, size. That's probably pretty accurate as far as size goes. Um, of course, the most well-known rose in the United States is Double Delight. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was Mr. Lincoln. Certainly, uh, you know, the, not perfect, but it's got its moments. And one of the hottest sellers for us that we couldn't get last year, we're getting this year, hopefully, is Yves Piaget from Europe. It's a French rose. But uh, that's uh, certainly one of the most awesome roses we've seen. And in about a month, we'll, well, actually six weeks from now, we'll be selling bare root roses. So they are essentially plant like this rose here, cut down to about a foot and a half of stem, no dirt, no pot, just the roots and the stems, and that's your bare root rose. So we'll be talking a lot about these. So the, one of the things to talk about is how to arrange a rose garden. Well. You don't have to make, quote, a rose garden. You can just put roses in with other shrubs. The main thing with roses is if they're by themselves, they rarely come down with many bad diseases or pests. When they're all alone, they don't attract much. It's just when you have a whole bunch of them, say five or six together, that's when you start getting more diseases. So I've grown roses you know, in places where they shouldn't be, and mostly shade. Uh, among, say, fruit trees, as you know, when they're by themselves, they seem to be pretty clean. It's just when you make a whole garden full of roses that they come down with more diseases and pests. So it's up to you how you want to arrange them. But a lot of people have them because they, you know, in a, together in a garden because they're very impressive that way. They have, say, four or five roses of the same type. So the average rose figure gets about three foot wide, about four foot tall, five foot tall. So that's the room you would give them in a garden. And if you wanted to make uh, a fairly you know, full garden of roses, then I would say you can arrange them. A lot of people do back to back. So three feet for each plant in a double row. And then if you have uh, more than one double row, then you want to make sure you have enough room between the rows. <clears throat> so you can have three, three. I would probably go five feet between the double rows of roses just because they don't, they actually, you know, cheat a little bit and get wider than three feet. So you just need some room. But if you're arranging a rose garden, Double rows, five feet between the clearance between those double rows. That's how a lot of, of private rose gardens are done, but there's no rules here. So I was down in a rose garden in Malibu once where the mildew was more prevalent, and they had their roses spaced about 10 feet apart. They had a lot of land where they had them, so they just gave them ample room, and that's fine. If you've got the room, you can space them that far apart, and they won't get mint. They'll get you know, more roses, fewer diseases that way. And certainly, again, there's no rules in your yard. You can put other shrubs among your roses. 
uh, planting other things among your roses cuts down on the diseases and pests also. Now the fortunate thing about roses is they're one of the least sensitive plants to poor soil conditions. So if you've got clay, if you've got sand, either one is fine. Uh, if you overload your soil with the wrong materials like compost, we don't recommend putting compost in the ground at all anymore. Uh, or if you do, just very, very lightly. Uh, even if you put them in almost solid compost, they'll still grow. They, uh, what we notice is that roses, they may not like the soil you give them, but they adapt to it uh, in different ways. So one time what I did, my first rose garden I had, we filled up a raised planter and I thought back in the 80s that the more compost you put in the ground the better. So we made this bed, raised bed essentially I would say one third or more compost which is way more than they should have had. Uh, we planted our roses in that soil <clears throat> And they did, they did exactly what I thought they would. They grew, <clears throat> you know, the average height, looked fine, bloomed fine. But years later, I pulled them out of the ground and noticed that the healthy roots were in the top four inches of soil. Anything below that was rotten and slimy. <clears throat> and I thought maybe I had planted the roses too deep so that any ro root below four inches was totally dead. Well, it turns out that the compost doesn't allow enough air into the soil, so the roots were all suffocated below four inches. But they had readapted, readjusted themselves to be uh, near the surface of the soil where they can breathe, and the plants looked fine and acted fine. So uh, they adapt very quickly to poor conditions. Water-wise, they like ample water. Uh, we notice a lot of rose gardens in the summer just shut down. Well, that's just not enough water. You've got to keep the ground pretty moist. Uh, the average rose plant probably uses a gallon or two a day of water in the summertime. And if you've got big trees around them, a lot more than that. So the pro one of the problems we have, I mean, if you have a rose garden isolated, yeah, you can go one or two gallons a day, you're fine. But if you've got a yard like most people do with big shade trees and all that, uh, you can have a shade tree 50 foot away that's drawing the water out of your rose garden. So watch the moisture level in the garden. Generally the way you check it is with a piece of rebar or metal rod or wooden dowel about two or three foot long and see if you can push near into the soil next to your roses at least a foot deep by hand. If you can push it down by hand a foot deep, the roots are well moist, all their entire depth, rose roots grow about a foot deep, and the rose is happy. If you can only push it down four inches, it's too dry. If you can push it down two feet, the rose will be real happy, you're wasting water. So, um, I mean, if you're in northern Pacific Northwest, uh, they get so much rain there. Most, you know, in most springs you can go up there and push a stick in the ground four or five foot deep. We did that one year. I mean, back in, I think it was 98, we had 30 inches of rain that year. I go next to my rose and push a rod in the ground about three foot deep. It was crazy. So if you get adequate rain or adequate moisture, they're, they're quite happy. I mean, roses do come, are native around the world. Um, the modern roses were developed in Europe back in the late 1800s and uh, they you know the rose, roses were most popular back in the 1990s in fact uh, one of the roses in the mid 90s this was the number one rose such a class but it was very prone to disease and I think that's what kind of caused a lot of trouble in the industry is that back in those days, they, everybody wanted the best roads. The best roads was highly prone to disease. Uh, everybody had to use all these chemicals to keep them looking nice. And I think people decided at that point, you know, this is not worth 
the efforts. A lot of people quit growing roses. The rose industry shrank, it's about two-thirds, half to two-thirds of what it was back in the mid-90s, so it's really shrunken a lot. But it's making a comeback now because the industry has uh, learned from its mistakes and they're growing roses that are more disease resistant now. So a lot of the roses that were real disease prone, we just don't handle them anymore. Uh, just go with the old tried and true ones. Also back in the 1960s, uh, a lot of rose companies were breeding roses on the west coast because we have you know, this is the ideal climate to grow roses better than, say, the, you know, the Midwest where it gets too cold in the winter or the East Coast where it's too hot and wet. So we're growing, you know, so they breed red roses locally like color magic. This thing can't take it below 40 degrees. <laughs> it is really, I mean, what a mistake. They, you know, they weren't testing the roses throughout the country. They were growing them, you know, uh, they had a, a a breeding ground right here in Irvine. It's like for 20, 30 years, there's a breeding ground right in the middle of Irvine for Jackson and Perkins, which was selling roses across the United States. Well, they're breeding roses here for the United States. You know, they were they were going. You know, they weren't doing the right right thing. So, uh, starting in the late 80s, early 90s, they started having test gardens all around the country to test the roses before they would put them on to mass markets. Because of that problem, they came and they had all these roses that were really sensitive to anything other than Southern California. So that was a mistake they made too. But this was this was a rose that was about eight or ten inches across. Just you know, you go. But even in my own garden, we'd lose entire branches in the winter to 30 degrees. It just wouldn't handle the cold at all. So. I mean, in the 90s, it got so serious, we had textbooks with all the roses listed in them. I mean, just imagine how many roses are in this thing. It's like 5,000, 6,000 rose, roses that were registered and had description, you know, official descriptions. So uh, I don't even know if they'd make this book anymore. This was uh, book number 11. They had to make a new one every year because there was like 200 or 300 roses introduced every year in the world. So, so roses got real serious for quite a while. Okay, so we'll get the roses in in a month as bare root. Uh, a lot of people are scared of bare root. Um, and that's probably due to the fact that there are places that sell roses that shouldn't be selling them. I mean, in the old days, all the nurseries sold the ro bare roses in the proper displays and all that. And nowadays, most of the roses are in little tiny plastic bags sitting on a store shelf. Nobody checks the moisture. So unless you get them the day they arrive, uh, they may be totally bone dry and already dead by the time you buy them. Uh, or you have to revive them to make sure that they survive. So we're one of the, we may be the only place left that stores them in a bin filled with wet sawdust roots in there. And we water that every day or even twice a day to keep moist to make sure that they're in prime condition when you get them. They are kind of, you know, roses don't go totally dormant. Uh, here in the middle of winter, though they're growing slowly, but they're still growing. So we only keep them in display for about a month before we have to can them up. So about a month, we get them in mid-December, and uh, by we'll get in several shipments. So by the end of January, we're pretty much done with the roses. Excuse me, one second. Victoria, can you close this door here? We're getting a little bit loud. It may or may not help. I've got open windows above it. Helps. Helps a bit. Okay, so when the roses come in, when we bag them up, we put them 
we get we have these real thick plastic bags. I mean, real thick. The thorns won't pierce them, and we'll put them in there with wet paper around them. Uh, they'll sit in that bag for a number of days without any trouble. If they're if they got leaves on them, it's nice to open up the top and let the leaves out of there so they don't start mold, getting moldy inside the bags. But I've stored roses in plastic bags for, especially if it's cool. If you have a cool spot, say outside in the shade so the sun doesn't hit the plastic bag, or if we're having a cool winter and you leave it in, even in your garage, they'll just sit there for a month or so without any problem. So they're not like a rose that's in a pot that's got green leaves on it where you have to water just about every day. Uh, the bare roses are you know, in a, a quiet state, so you don't have to do too much with them. Now you can take the bare root rose and put it in a bucket of water. And it'll sit there, even if it's leafing out, that's fine. If, you, if the roots are in the water, the top's sticking out, uh, it can sit in there for a month. There's no issue. It, it, it's got what it needs. Uh, clean water down below. Now if you want to make the best rose bed you can, now you may not. So the florist rose growers uh, pretty much grow roses in straight sand. Sand is the most vigorous way to grow rose. Our top pot, pot well our potting soils, they'll also grow real vigorous, but you may not want to do them uh, in the most vigorous dirt you can. I mean clay will be the least vigorous, uh, sand is the most vigorous. But florist roses, they want, you know, for the florist industry, they want the longest, straight of stems. So rose and sand grow really tall. Uh, one of our customers was in Saudi Arabia. He said he had a, um, a trailer parked on the sand and he wanted to grow roses like he had in his own backyard in Orange County. And everybody told him it's crazy, it's just pure sand. We said all his roses were above the trailer. They were that tall. So that's what happens when you have sand, is they just grow crazy. Uh, you have to water them and fertilize them a little more frequently than you would in clay, but they're really, really vigorous. So you may not want to prepare your bed the best you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of sand, like, you can find sand and you can throw, like? Any sand, well, there's no, you know, sand, as far as sand goes, you buy sand from one company, you buy sand from another, totally different looking. So they get sand from the riverbeds, and every riverbed has a different looking sand. It's yeah. different size grains, different color, uh, slightly different makeup, but they all work. So, so play sand, wash sand, concrete sand, plaster sand, uh, and a building supply yard, it may just be called masonry sand. Stuff you make things out of. Is that okay? That's fine. So, uh, well, bulk sand is cheaper, but again, you don't need that. You can get by, you know, in a raised bed. I might want to use decomposed granite instead. It's a lot cheaper than sand. It's got little a hint of clay in there, uh, and it may be one third the cheaper. And fill soil is fine too. Just sandy loam. This is sandy dirt, and that's also cheaper than sand. So um, all those are fine. Uh, you can you can use our potting soils. So if we're going in a pot, now in the nursery, when we grow roses in pots, we use our acid mix because the roses tend to need a lot of water in a pot when they get big in a pot and they drought fast. So our acid mix has more water holding potential than our top pot, but in the long run our top pots is a little more permanent, it won't shrink as much, so if you have a large enough pot or if you're filling up a, a raised bed, use the top pot if you're going to use something in, from our nursery and bags. Essentially our top pot resembles sandy dirt and weighs about a third as much. <laughs> That's the advantage, it just weighs less because it's not, not real dirt. Uh, in, we use it because our pots are too small. No, if I have like a, I have like 10 year old rows. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's fine. 
it works. So we grow all our roses that we grow anyway in our astomix. Um, but you know, if you had a choice in a big container, you could use the top pot instead. The astomix does shrink a little because it's more organic than the top pot. You you could mix the two together. It's, you can make your own soil too, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can mix them. So once you get the soil down, it's time to plant your roses. So let's make this the soil level here. So you, the picture of the bare rose I showed you. Uh, the classic bare rose has a usually has a straight stem that's the rootstock, and then it's got the roots. And then most of them are grafted. We're growing more and more own roses, but most of them have are grafted. So there's <laughs> stems coming up like this off one side of that normally. So when you take your bare root rose and you're ready to plant it. Um, you can prune these branches short. Usually when we get them, they're between a foot and two foot long. We like to have them for, on display about 10 inches or so, but the shorter you cut your stems when you plant them, the less you have to worry about them. Unfortunately, rose stems, you know, if you had an apple tree, their, their stems are so heavily covered with wax, they never dry up in the wind or anything. You just put them in the ground, they're fine. But rose stems aren't, especially when they're green. The older plants have covered with bark, no problem, but the green stems we get on the roses, which are only a year old, uh, do lose moisture. So if we're having a Santa Ana condition, and I, like we're first selling roses right now, the air is dry, uh, then these stems, if you just had them real long, sticking out of the ground and it, any breeze at all, they just shrivel up. It takes the roots about a week to get going, sometimes two weeks to get going, and in that time these stems can shrivel. Once the roots get in good growth mode, then the tops won't shrivel anymore in the, wind, in the dry air. But for the first two weeks on a bare roots life, if the air is dry, now last winter we were real moist, we didn't have to worry about it. We can just tell people, yeah, just plant the rose in the ground at the right height. Uh, now, there's no rules here either. You want to bury the roots. Now, in, in Southern California, this is the way they're grown in the fields with uh, usually a few inches of the rootstock shown. And this is usually green and that's usually brown, so you can tell where it, where it ends. And the bud union is usually two or three inches above the ground. So that's how they were grown. But if you're living in Minnesota, you would plant this rose this deep because the soil insulates and protects this area so it doesn't freeze in the winter. So there's no rules. You can plant your rose this deep, and I've done it. Because the LA Times back in the 80s ran an article saying, why do we plant roses this way when the rest of the country, most of the country, plants it this way? <laughs> So I tried it back in the 80s. I planted my roses at deep. They did fine. The only thing you have to watch out for is if you reap, if you plant this rose in an old rose bed and you've got wounds on these stems and they come in contact with that rose dirt, the dirt that had the old rose's remnants in there, then sometimes we get uh, bacterial cankers forming on these stems. Uh, a open wound in contact with soil that had roses previously sometimes gets this, this uh, bacterial canker. It's like a cancer that forms big, big growths on the stems and the roots. Can't cure it. Doesn't seem to do that much damage though, but it's not, it's not real pretty to do that. So I found out if you prune, if you do your pruning the day before on the roots and the stems, if you need to do any, you know, too long a root or too long a stem. Prune them the day before. Before you plant them, it gives the wound time to heal, and then you don't get those bacterial cankers forming on the stems or roots. No open wounds. I mean, a couple days would be better, but I found if you prune it the day before you planted it, 
we would stop getting the cankers on the cankers. What they look like are big knots of woody tissue that'll form when you have uh, dirt splashed onto open wounds. So I used to get these, if I would prune them and put them right in the ground, then I'd get these big old cankers forming on them. So, so prune them. If you need to prune them, prune them the day before you plant them. And height-wise, you get, want to get the roots in the ground, uh, stems in the air, but you can bury the stems quite deeply. It's fine. Well, the shorter you cut them, the less likely they are to dry up. Now, the other thing you can do is just bury them temporarily. So back in the 80s and 90s, when we saw a lot of Santa Ana conditions, we know our rows were, were having trouble. We tell people, okay, plant them this way, get the soil nice and wet all around here to water them in real good, and then dig a trench around them and mound the soil like this. So essentially, you were covering them deeper. And then once they started to grow, just wash the dirt off. And the LA Times even had, or some of the other ref journals were saying, okay, if you don't have enough dirt, put some newspaper, make a little cylinder out of newspaper around here and then fill it with dirt. If you have enough dirt, just mount it over like that. And wait till they sprout, then you can wash it off. Do not use compost. No. I, I used compost one year. I thought, oh, I don't have enough dirt. Let's pile some compost over the stems. Every leaf that comes out gets eaten up by the compost. <laughs> it's, that's, that's the job of a compost pile is to, to eat up dead leaves. Well, it eats the live ones too. So it just ate up all the new growth that came off this rose. Don't want to use compost. That's, compost's job is to eat leaves not grow leaves, so keep the compost well below your stems where you want them to sprout. If they're in pots, of course you can just put them in a pot, put the pot in the shade by next to a wall where the wind won't hit it, it's fine. Or just cut it short. Again, you can cut the stems. The shorter you cut them, um, you might lose you know, a few flowers when you cut it real short but you're not, they won't dry up. So a lot of times, at our store anyway, we'll cut them to about four inches because we don't, we can't cover them and we can't hide them, so we just cut them all to about four inches. Uh, we only have maybe one out of every hundred roses not sprout if we have dry conditions. In fact, we always have like one out of a hundred that are just bad from the growers anyway. So. So they should sprout around here anyway, because we're our weather is not too cold to grow roses in the winter, just slow. So they you should see some activity within a week. The bud swelling. Uh, two weeks you should see some leaves starting to to, to come out. Um, occasionally, we get rose. You know, the, what, some of the problems that occur is if the growers. You know, they store these things, if you ever look at pictures of how they do this, they have these huge warehouses that are two stories high. The roses are stacked from floor to ceiling, just stacked up. And it's humid in there, and they have sprinklers, little sprinklers. They sprinkle them now and then. And they keep those um, warehouses about 45 degrees. But occasionally, we'll get frozen roses. Now, what, the way they're doing it, so right now, if you go up to uh, the Central Valley, they grow them all around near Fresno. Wasco, California, which is just near Fresno, is where uh, Jackson Perkins used to be. And they, I think they still get roses from there. Star Rose, which is currently the biggest rose company in the world, is there. Weeks Rose is the second biggest in the United States, is, is there too. And they like that area because for two reasons, uh, well, more than two. It's hot there in the summer, they don't have to spray for diseases, and it's dry, so there's no disease problems. The other thing is the soil is very shallow, so the roses roots don't grow very deep. We used to get roses from Howard's of Hemet in Hemet, 
the soil there is sandy three or four foot down. And the problem they had was the rose roots would just go straight down forever. And when we get the roses, they would have one root, you know, that thick on them, this long is all they can dig out because <laughs> the roots are going straight down. So in, in uh, Wasco, they can't go very deep. It's very shallow soil. So you know, all the rose roots are very close to the surface. So we get more roots, roots on the roses. So, um, you know, it's, it's like you have to grow the roses where, they, where you get the best results. Uh, also, what happens there is this time of year, or uh, from about mid-November on, it's just foggy. The whole area is foggy, so they said they can just take a, a thousand roses and plow them out of the ground and leave them there and collect them over a period of several days because it's all fogged in. They get that Thule fog down there, whatever it's called. Uh, in late November, December, when they're digging the roads out of the ground. So they said the climate here is just perfect for bare roots because they can take their time digging them up. And then, we, you know, they, they um, bundle them in groups of five, and then they have chain uh, band saws. They just cut all the tops and the roots at once. So sometimes we get very little top, very long top. Now the... I have to mention this. I hope the person's not here. But last year we had a, uh, we sold uh, some roses to a customer. And I always warn them about their gardeners. You know, gardener planting sometimes goes awry. So after a month they said, my roses aren't sprouting. And I said, well, send me a photo. And they sent me a photo. And their gardener had planted all their roses upside down. The roots were in the air. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was laughing for days after that. I just couldn't believe that that had happened. So that's, that's what you get when you get gardeners that don't know, uh, haven't experienced bare rose, they don't know what we're looking at. So you have to explain to them how to plant these things. <laughs> anyway. So, anyway. Um, Think. Now, we don't really sell tree roses bare root. The tree roses have a three-foot trunk, and then the stems are up here. So we hate, we've kind of quit selling those as bare root because they just drop so easily. People would bring them back all shriveled up. We'd have to bury them in our sawdust for a couple weeks to get them to hydrate again and fill out and grow. So now we just pot them up, put them underneath our shade, where it's nice and humid, no wind, and let them sprout and then sell them. I mean, most uh, nurseries that sell tree roses put them in their greenhouses for the same reason. They just stick the plants in the greenhouse where there's no dry air and no wind to dry them up and get them going before they sell them out. So that's so we don't sell tree roses as bare root anymore. Just the bushes and the climbers, which all look the same. Um, so once they sprout and get going, then you wash the dirt down. You can mulch the surface. So we like to mulch the surface, and you can feed them at the same time. So when we do that, now my house, one of the things that I would start doing is put a put about a quarter inch to half inch of uh, chicken manure. And then put about an inch, inch and a half of uh, some coarser material like bark on top of that. And that would feed them for a year. So you have some options when you're um, feeding your roses, instead of using a, quote, regular fertilizer, you can use, I have something called garden compost, and that'll work fine, too, because the garden compost has chicken manure in it. The straight chicken does have other things in it, too, so they're almost the same product, but if you put quarter inch, half inch around your roses on top of the ground, and then cover with the bark. Uh, that provides nutrition, 
the bark provides insulation, weed control, some disease control and pest control, so that helps too. Well, that's fine. Cover the ground with something. That's fine. Yeah, I just want the ground covered because bare dirt around roses is, once you get to June and July, is just too hot. Um, what they found is that if it's 90 degrees, you got bare dirt, you go down where the roots are a foot deep, it's 120 degrees down there. It's just too hot. Plant roots do not like to be above 85. And they found in Texas, if they put three inches of mulch on top of the ground, the same root depth was 85, 86 degrees, right where the roots like it. So if you mulch your ground around your roses, sunny roses look a lot better because, you know, if, it's, if you don't mulch them, the roots have to go deeper where they can't breathe to, to not cook. But if you mulch the soil, they can exist right on the surface where everything is better conditions. It's more air, it's usually water, it's closer to the fertilizer and all that stuff. So mulching a rose bed really helps out. It's easy to see the difference between a mulch bed and unmulched bed or just grow plants around it. If you grow anything around here and cover the ground, it does the same thing. Generally because whatever you plant here provides a lot of comp uh, dead, dead leaves too. Nothing really. Well, a mulch can be gravel, okay. but compost would be something that's dead. So, yes. So, um, this is for the bare roots, but in general, um, then the Southern California, then the Indian. What, what, what is the season? That's good. Um, so, back in the 80s, LA Times wrote articles about rose you know, once you know we don't really have to prune roses back every winter we don't have to but most it's been a tradition it's one time when people make their roses smaller again so they're a little prettier but you don't have to do it and you don't have to do it in the winter uh, anywhere else in the country they do it when the snow melts which is often April March or April so there was a um, comment in the LA Times by the garden writer saying why do we do it in December? The most disease uh, uh, promoting weather we get is January, February, March. The water on the leaves cause all these diseases so why don't we just wait for the end of winter to do roses pruning? So at that time I decided let's try April. So April you know, and during the winter, your roses are growing, but slowly. Suddenly in April, all the, all the shoots start to grow from the base. And, there's, you can't, and you can't wait any longer than that. So that's when I started doing it. I said, okay, let's prune it back in April. And your plant is, at that time, full of all these diseased leaves because of the rains, rust and black spot and all this other stuff. So you prune in April, get rid of all the diseased foliage. Um, and sometimes disease canes, you can cut them off. And generally, the plant sits still for two weeks and then starts to, re to grow new foliage. And by the time the leaves are out, it's May, it's pretty dry, no more disease problems. Unless we have an El Nino that year where it rains into June. Uh, so then you don't have to worry about the diseases as much. So now, you know, I just wait till April, pretty much every year, at least till the end of March. Because the end of March, sometimes the rose starts growing if it's warm. Uh, sometimes it's April. But as soon as you see the, the new growth starting to push at the base of the rose, that's when I usually do it. Because I know that you can't wait any longer. That's the last time I can prune it without damaging the new growth. So I cut off all the old leaves at that time, usually all the diseases, uh, and you're clean. And then I would... Then what I would do is I would take all the old mulch off the base of my roses with all the dead leaves and things mixed in, which is probably not essential to do because they know now that the dead rose leaves on the ground really don't harbor diseases. 
they, they apparently when the rose leaves hit the ground, all the bacteria and things that are on the ground start killing off all the diseases that are sitting on the rose leaves. So it's not that big deal. But what I would do, because my rose garden was in the front yard, clear off all this so it looks better, throw all that mulch underneath the fruit trees in the backyard, and then put a new layer of this down every, every spring. So it'd look all fresh again and be, and be good for the next year. Well, um, you go with the weather. I mean, I remember some winters we'd have, I remember one winter we had 70 mile an hour winds in December. Strip the rows totally. So I said, okay, we'll cut them back. <laughs> they're, they're, they're hard. There's no leaves left anyway. So it depends what, what nature gives you. If sometimes if the, you, know, you get these real strong winds, strip the roses, do it then. But you can prune rose any time of year you want. I've done it in August, um, just to see what would happen, and it was fine. In fact, there's a lot of people who do it twice a year, because rose leaves generally only live six months. So by summer, you've got all these. Uh, by late summer, you've got all these old, ugly leaves on your plant. So if you just cut them back at that time, they come out fresh leaves again. And your plants look like spring in the fall. So, uh, do you ever use an Epsom salt mixture? I'll often hear that associated with roses. Yeah, that's so that's Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. And magnesium and sulfur are two essential minerals. Um, I don't know who started that, but it's not that good because if you just put down magnesium sulfate, uh, they say your plants will go straight into a potassium deficiency because it's too much of one item. So there's a product on the shelf called Langbanite, which is um, magnesium sulfate combined with potassium sulfate in the right ratios, which is twice as much potassium as magnesium is the ratio the plant wants. So that's much better if you're going to do it. But if you just get a good organic fertilizer, I mean, chicken's fine. Um, there's a lot of good fertilizers out there that have both in there, then that's safer. But uh, to do one mineral is, unless you have a soil test done or a, a tissue test done by a soil lab would be counterproductive perhaps. Because again, you can put your plant into potassium deficiency. So, um, we'll talk about them. So. So if you want to use the conventional ones, um, now back in the 80s when the organics were first introduced, I thought, can't be anything to this. But what I noticed is I was using uh, grow power, which is not an organic, although it's organic base, it's not an organic fertilizer. <clears throat> and usually within a couple of years, my roses would have some sort of deficiency, iron, zinc, something going on and I'd have to correct it. Well, then I switched to organic fertilizers and never saw that again. So I said, okay, organic fertilizers. The nice thing about organic fertilizers is because they're ground up plants and or animals, everything's there. They're not missing anything. Whereas the chemical fertilizers, they put in certain things and that make a biggest difference, but they don't put everything in here like this particular widely used chemical fertilizer contains um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and sulfur. And that's all it has. Um, four of the 13 minerals you have to add are in here. So if you just do this and your ground doesn't have the rest, you can run into some kind of deficiency within a few years or even within a year Whereas if you go with this, and this contains fish bones, alfalfa, other parts of the fish, sulfur, kelp, kelp flour, rock phosphate, potassium sulfate, um, even though they only list four things, five things in here, it's got everything. Because when you grind up a plant, 
everything's in it. Or you go something like seed meals. I love seed meals. Like there's cotton seed, neem seed, soybean seeds. Uh, because you figure the seed of a plant is loaded with all the minerals that the plant needs to grow. The seed is supposed to be have all the minerals right there. So you grind up seeds, you got everything. Uh, especially in our dirt here, for a growing plant, a new growing plant, this is a better formula. For a really old plant, this might be good, but growing plants, they need that nitrogen, the first number. Now, the only thing our soil in Orange County has got enough of, and maybe even, too, well, not too much, enough of, is the middle number. We don't need the middle number. In the ground. In a pot you would, but in the ground you don't. Because our soil has plenty of phosphorus in it, that's, and that's the only thing we have plenty of. Is, well, we have plenty of nickel, we have plenty of cobalt. There's a lot of the minor nutrients, micronutrients we have plenty of. But of the major ones, this is the only one we're adequate of. We don't have any, you know, there's never any nitrogen in the ground. Uh, and our potassium's kind of on the low side, too. So the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, I like this formula a lot for new plants. But as long as you're giving them adequate amounts, anything of these organics will work just fine. And chicken seems to work really well for some reason. <laughs> We're not quite sure why chicken works so well. Now, one of the interesting products out on the market is this one, Magnum Rose Grow. So Dr. Tommy Cairns, who's a rose, I don't know if he's still alive, was a huge rose enthusiast, used to volunteer, he was a chemist, worked and volunteered at uh, Rose Hills in Whittier. So real local soil. He analyzed the soil there and analyzed rose. He says, this is what we need to feed the roses at Rose Hills. So he made this specifically for Rose Hills. So it should work really well here too. It's a chemical fertilizer. It's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The nine minerals he figured they needed the most of, he put in here. It's a water soluble powder. Ideally, you'd, you'd put this on every time you watered. However, right, he, on the instructions on here, every two weeks. Ideally, if you can do it every time, it, it, it's really good. Now, the problem with chemicals in the long run, in the long run, is that this feeds the plant, but it doesn't feed the dirt. So if you want to keep your dirt healthier and fluffier and all that, the organics are better. But this works faster. So the thing about organics is something in the ground's got to eat this first and poop it out before your plants get it or eat it and die before your plants get the minerals. Whereas this goes right into your plant. But this is what nature would want for the, for the ecosystem is something organic or you know, chicken or just in reality, dead leaves is what nature feeds off of. So if you have enough dead leaves in your garden and you don't mind the look of it, just cover the ground around your rose with dead leaves, they're fine. Now water-wise, most serious rose growers water daily and in ag culture in general. So we grow roses like a crop. You want it to produce flowers, so you have to give it ideal conditions. So you want the moisture level to stay as even as you can, which and that's you know, a good foot deep. You want your soil to be wet a foot deep. And the best way to maintain that is to water at least once a day, say if it's above 80 degrees during the day. If it's below 80, the plants are, you know, like right now, it's above 80, but the nights are in low 50s. Plants don't use any water below 55 degrees. So if it's, I would say we hit 55, right, 9 o'clock last night, maybe 8 o'clock last night, it was cold. And it was 55 probably till 9 this morning. So for half the day, the plant, it wasn't using any water. But say a month ago, it was 
90 degrees in day and 70 at night. Plants using water day and night. So right now the water usage of the plants are, has really dropped off. So you may just water once a week at this point. I mean, ideally, it's still best to water every day, just less. In other words, in the summertime, you may have to water your rows a gallon a day. In the winter, maybe a pint a day. But not many timers can do that, so you just do as well as you can. Maybe once a day, a gallon, once a, once a week in the winter, and a gallon every day in the summertime. Something like that. Keep the moisture as even as you can. In ag culture, they found out two generations ago that the more frequently you water, the least, less at one time, the more efficient the use of water is. It's not what the water district keeps promoting. Deep and frequent irrigation is the most wasteful use of water in ag culture. If you just don't want people to use water, that's what you tell them. But uh, um, the most efficient use of water is to water it frequently and lightly. We'll have to uh, talk to the homeowners associations about this because <laughs> none of them know anything apparently about how to use water efficiently. So. Okay, so pests, as far as pests goes, it's not as easy as it used to be. So there, if you go back to the 1980s, the only thing we had to worry about really were thrips in the flowers in the spring which weren't deadly, mildew and rust. That was it. And we found out in the 80s if you sprayed your roses once a week with oil you wouldn't have to worry about anything. But in the 90s what happened, I mean it's just worldwide travel. So people travel all around the world. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was bringing things from other countries. Suddenly we had, or from the East Coast to the West Coast, we had black spot in the 1990s. We started seeing black spot. Uh, and then downy mildew came in to California in the mid-90s with the El Ninos. So suddenly all the rose growers in California were having to spray constantly. We're having to use all these new chemicals to keep the roses clean. Now fortunately, homeowners, it's not that big a deal. If you have some spots on your leaves, we don't have, um, you know, the, the climate they have east of the Rockies is real conducive to diseases. Wet leaves in the summer. That's real bad for roses. Wet leaves in the winter is not so bad because most diseases don't like it cold. So it's not so bad. But if it's 80 degrees and your rose leaves are wet, you get black spot. All these, you know, you get rust, you get all these things, botrytis, all these things come up and get your roses. Uh, here, we're dry in the summer most, for the most part. So it's a lot easier to uh, handle handle the diseases here. So you can get by without using anything nasty. Uh, although we got this new bug now, unfortunately, that can mess up your roses for several months. So there's this thing that came in called a chili thrip. Came in five years ago. Um, what it does to the roses. So this year we saw it right at the end of August. Now if you're in Florida, you know, it's bad news there. I mean, they get so hot in Florida so early that the chili thrip appears around May. And they have it in, through October. This year we got it in late August and uh, got real nasty by mid-September. But this is the end of its season. It's getting too cold for it again. But what the chili thrips do is they're real tiny bugs that are kind of elongated bugs, but they're real small, so it's, it's pretty hard to notice them, but they'll get on the new growth of your roses and scratch and, and, and pierce, well, they don't really pierce. They, they kind of 
make slices in the new tissue of the roses. So especially the brand new growth, the real tender growth, they slice it all up. And whatever oozes out of those slices, they lap it up. That's the way they feed. So if you make thousands of slices on all the new growth, they are badly scarred. They just start turning gray from all the scarring. And if there's enough chili thrips on them, the whole thing just shrivels up. It just, it just dries up, shrivels up, turns black. So when the chili thrips arrived in you know, four or five years ago, yeah, it was nasty. All the ends of everybody's branches in, in late summer were all just black. No new flowers. Um, fortunately, the season for us is kind of short compared to some of the other places in, in the United States. So, um, and some people just cut all that off, just keep cutting it off until the season's over, then right now they'd look fine again. There are treatments for it, but that means you have to spray more. Fortunately, there's an organic way to control it. Mm -hmm. Is this normal? No. Is Roundup this? damage. Roundup? Okay. So if we got, if someone's spraying Roundup, so we just got this from a nursery, a big wholesale nursery uh, yesterday. <laughs> and we noticed this. They go, okay, now well, they, got, they got a little liberal with the Roundup there. So that's what Roundup does. Well, there is a new disease that's, well, not new, it's been around a long time, called rose rosetting disease that'll make all the new growth do, get real skinny like that. Rose rosette, you can't cure it, you just have to destroy the plant. Uh, I think it's a virus spread by a microscopic mite. And it's been seen in, they introduced that disease to the U.S. to kill wild roses. Some crazy person said, I want to kill all these wild roses. Let's use this disease to do it. Like, <laughs> so it got out of hand, and now it's causing trouble all over the United States, rose rosette disease. Uh, but you'll know, you, definitely what will happen is all the new growth, starting on one branch, starts doing that, and it continues over and over, and the plant gets it. Uh, and all you can do is throw the plant away. And it, you can't just lop it off. No. no, it's inside the plant by that time. Oh, wow. So you just, so like uh, two years ago, one of our suppliers, no, it's just last year, it showed up on their farm where they're growing the uh, bare roses. So they just destroyed one third of their crop mm -hmm. to make sure it didn't spread. Some other nurseries aren't that conscientious. They'll just, you know, if it shows up, they'll sell the plants anyway because they, you know, they'll lose their shirts if they don't. So that's how it spreads commercially. But uh, it spread to your other plants. Yeah, it doesn't spread that fast normally because it's a real tiny mite that does that one. But uh, certainly it can. So. Well, there's a lot of bugs. We have sharpshooters. Yeah. Sharpshooters uh, move quickly. They go from yeah. stem to stem. And then they eat the, like, I thought that maybe it, this has the No. Sharpshooters are like big aphids. They don't do any visible damage. They just suck on the plant. And they poop. They call them sharpshooters because their poop is liquid and they shoot it out. So if you're standing in your yard underneath a tree and you feel drops on you, the sharpshooter is up in the tree and it's sucking on the sap and it's pooping out its excrement and it drops on you and you feel that. But right now we don't know of any diseases that are spreading on roses, but the sharpshooter is transmitting diseases that wiped out the oleanders, uh, killed olives, kills grapes, uh, liquid amber trees. So they are bad news, but so far nothing, nothing serious on roses. So. so for the chili trips, um, what oh. do you recommend? 
So if you want to, so the two chemicals documented to control chili thrips the best, um, spinosad and Captain Jacks. So there's a lot of products that contain spinosad, and this is considered organic. Kills 95% uh, of the chili thrips that it encounters. The other one is the chemical in here called imidacloprid. Also known as merit. Also kills 95% of the chili thrips it's in contact with. This got a bad name ten years ago. It still kind of has a bad name, but it's been excused for killing bees. This is the one that everyone's blaming for the bee deaths in the United States. And it's been exonerated because no one can prove it. They said uh, they don't find this chemical in beehives at a high enough quantity to blame it. Because when a bee dies from this product, it doesn't make it back to the hive. It just dies in the field. So um, they're saying it might contribute a little bit, but you know if the beehive is unhealthy. But they said right now in the United States, currently, there's more beehives than ever before. Uh, it's just that the number of beehives goes, you know, they get cycles where bees die and then they don't die and they die and they don't die and Merit came out as the bees were going into a down cycle so they all blaming Merit so they did millions of dollars worth of research on Merit and it's not the problem so that's it is a bee disease that's been wiping the bees out it's called uh, it's a disease that the varroa mites which are parasite mites that live on bees is spreading because they said that in Australia there are no varroa mites in Australia they use this and they have no problem with their bees in Switzerland they're, they don't use any pesticides and they're still having problem with their bees because they have the varroa mites and the diseases that are that that varroa mite spreads on bees it's real hard to control varroa mites on bees you have to put a miticide a pest killer inside your beehive if you put too much in there, you wipe out your bees, but you have to have enough so it kills the mites that are on the bees. It's like you know, putting flea stuff on your pets. You don't want to use too much, but you got to control that little pest on the bee. But terrible problem on the bees. But so that's not to blame. But still, we don't. You know, if you want to go organic, um, spinosad is better. Now the official recommendation is to topically apply these products, that is spray them on the, on, the, on the buds and the new growth. Do this twice, this lasts two weeks, this lasts supposedly a month. Do this twice, do this twice, do this twice, and you don't get any buildup of, of immune uh, thrips. But if you want to go organic, we're telling people, okay, do this one week, use an oil spray of some sort the next week and then go back to this one. Now we're starting, we haven't played with the new oils late enough yet. They're brand new we, and the, the nursery industry and ag culture is really doing a lot of experimenting with these because they think these will be um, a lot safer around people. So this one by Dr. Earth and there's a lot of other ones similar to this on the market. Rosemary oil, sesame oil, peppermint oil, thyme oil, cinnamon oil, garlic oil. This was the one we were using in the past, just neem oil. This uh, all neem oil. This one's a mixture of seven different oils. Six different oils. So with bugs, they don't they think with just one oil they might become immune to the ingredients in here, but with seven different oils in here, they don't think the bugs can, any bug can survive that. And you know, all the oils that these plants make, they make to repel bugs or kill bugs. That's what the role is in these herbs, is to deter pests. 
So they think that this will be really good because these are food grade material. And the nice thing is the EPA doesn't have to look at this. So on all the other materials that are sold in the market, the EPA has got to check it out and check out all the claims that it does and puts warnings on them. On the food grade materials, since these are all food grade, they don't have to say anything. There's no EPA number, there's no warnings on here because you can drink this stuff. It's all food grade. So agriculture especially is real interested in this because if they can kill pests with this and they don't have to tell the EPA about it and they don't have to worry about customers getting hurt by it, uh, they're very happy. So we're going to be working more with these. So we're telling people, okay, if you want to see organic, spinosad one week because this is known to kill a lot of thrips and then use the oils the next week. Now the problem we're having with spinosad and with sprays in general is if it's not an oil, it's hard for things to stick to the rosebuds. They're real waxy. So if you just take this product and spray it on the rosebud, it doesn't work. Um, you have to have a wetting agent here, a soap-like material to make the water wetter and cling to this better. Um, the problem in our trade is they no longer, the one we want, Monterey Bay's Nature's Own Spray Helper, it's natural soaps and oils. To add to this, we can't get anymore. Apparently they don't even make it anymore. Um, and this, the one we tried to use instead, this ruins roses. You, sp you add this, this is a soap and an oil, and you add this to this, and you spray it on that, the rose turns out really strange looking. This has got some problems with plants. Uh, the spreader sticker, I guess it's supposed to be used in weed killers only, but it says, you know, spreader sticker. Uh, now in the nursery, I can get a professional one that comes in a gallon, costs like 30 bucks, and it's harmless to roses. But I can't find a single one on the market that won't hurt the roses. So we tell people, okay, make up your own, get some dish soap, like Dawn or Ivy or something like that, and add about three drops to this. It's about 10 drops per gallon is what most um, strong wetting agents do. So with most of the stronger soaps out there, if you go about 10 drops per gallon or in this quart about two to three drops, Try that and see if it clings to the buds. If it doesn't cling, it doesn't work. So what's wrong is if there's if you don't add a wet agent to this, it just beads up and won't stick to it. If you add too much wetting agent, it'll just run off, won't even stay on the plant. So you have to add just the right amount where it, it kind of clings and forms a film on there without running off. So it's become a little harder because we don't have a good wetting agent because the wetting agents come with instructions to tell you how much to use. Your, you know, your dish soap doesn't. But uh, try that because I know this one's going to cause trouble on your roses. This one doesn't seem to cause trouble on citrus trees, but on roses it makes them really weird looking. It makes them, acts almost like roundup, makes them just stretch out, get real skinny looking. So when you spray roses, generally you have to add something, uh, they call it a wetting agent or spreader sticker to make it stick on to that, except for the oils. The oils stick quite well by themselves, but you have to be careful. If you add a lot of pesticides, if you add to the oil, it burns. Especially this, this oil here tends to burn easy. The other oils may not, but I haven't fooled around with those enough to know if you can add the other oil I sell on the shelf, the other horticultural oil to this and still have, make it work. Soap is safer. So for the chili thrips, oil one week, spinosad the next, oil one week, spinosad, that's, that's about as good as you can do that way. Or spinosad and merit is what the professionals do. 
I mean, there's other things that we'll spray on them too to control bugs is so we don't run into a problem with uh, Im immune bugs. Diseases, the same thing goes on. Now, most diseases you can ignore here, especially if you time your pruning for spring, then the rust and the black spot don't mean much. But if you want to control mildew, so generally the biggest problem we have here is we have mildew weather. Uh, mildew weather is humid nights, uh, warm days, say 80 degrees, 75, 80 degrees, cool nights in the 50s, which is the weather Orange County is known for. I mean, that's more so than any other part of the country. We, you know, the California coastline has that weather, which everybody just loves, uh, but mildew likes it too. Mildew doesn't like hot all the time like it is back east. Mildew does not like rain. Rain washes mildew off, so don't worry about getting your rose leaves wet. Before we had other products, the only thing we could do to stop mildew, get out there with the hose every morning and wash them down. They don't like moving water. So, uh, in fact, diseases in general don't like moving water. So even though rust needs water, black dot needs water, a lot of diseases need water on the roses, they don't like moving water. So if you've got sprinklers constantly going in rows, you'll never get diseases because the, the, it keeps washing the spores of the diseases right off. What the diseases want, they want a still drop of water sitting there for four hours. Now, you know, today, there's no drop of water that would sit here for four hours. It's too, the air's too dry. It would just dry off and disappear within an hour. So the diseases can't start in our, this weather. But if, you, you know, if you're in New Jersey and it's 90% humidity, it's 80 degrees, that water drop is going to sit there all day. So that disease can get started. But, uh, so you can use water to control diseases, but be careful with the weather that day. If it's real humid, it's overcast, you don't want to get your leaves too wet because they can stay wet for a long time. Our cat just saw a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so um, so if you're irrigating overhead, it's fine, but make sure that you irrigate at a time of day when the leaves will dry off fairly fast. Now, if sanding condition, you can water at night, doesn't matter. But if it's uh, June gloom, you want to water, say, mid-morning so that it has the best chance of drying off by noon. If you use uh, drip irrigation, no, no issues. Now, we know the Port and Rose Garden has both drip system for watering the roses and overhead sprinklers for controlling bugs and disease. They said this bugs too. If they turn on their sprinklers, and Portland's inland pretty far. If, you, if you've been to Portland, it's like Chino or it's inland pretty far, so it's pretty hot there. So it's maybe five more miles, eh, 10 more miles inland than here uh, in, in Oregon. So they're 90 degrees every day, but they, they said they turn on their sprinklers for two minutes every morning. And they've had 90% they've had fewer bugs and diseases on the roses by doing that. cools the rose off. Water does not burn. Ro water cools old wives' tale. And, right. Don't believe people who tell you that. Otherwise, everybody on the beach would be burning up from the water. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, water just cools. It doesn't burn anything. The reason why people think water burns leaves is because a water drop on a leaf would sit in the same spot where a burn would occur. Because burns don't the edge of the leaf is cooler. The hottest, the most vulnerable part on a, on a leaf is the center vein is stronger, so they usually burn between the center vein and the edge of the leaf, and that's about where the water droplet would sit too. But uh, it's not as, water does not cause burning. So then I, I want to water my roses. I have to always be careful just to keep under face. Don't have to be careful about See, putting it. Now we can just yeah. Unless it's June gloom or it's real cloudy out there, you can water any part of the rose, it's fine. 
Okay, let's see. Um, as far as pruning goes, there have been whole textbooks wrote, written about pruning roses properly. So they made a lot of rules over the years, and now nobody really talks about those rules anymore because they found out that none of them were any good. So the thing you want to do primarily is once the rose is finished blooming, if it doesn't drop off by itself, take off the old bloom. That's the most important thing because what, it, what the rose might do is make a seed, a little fruit, they call it a rose hip, and it'll spend a month or two months doing that, and it can't bloom during that time. If you take these off, then it says, okay, there's no seed to be made. They'll make another flower instead. So that's the most important thing to do on your roses is knock off the old flowers. Now, the way florist people work, so the one thing to know about pruning roses is that the more you cut off, see you have a rose plant here and you have a stem with a flower on it. Well, the, the longer stem you cut off, the further down you go, the longer it takes it to make a new flower, but the longer the stem is. So the florist growers, after they cut a flower, they cut that stem down real short because they want a real long straight stem and the way to do that is to cut it all the way down so then it grows a long it takes longer to grow that stem back and then they bloom again the less you cut the quicker it can make a bloom but the shorter the stem uh, sometimes if you just cut this much off there's not enough energy here to make a new flower just make some leaves but the next one down will make a flower with a stem with a with flower on it. So it's not that big a deal. So what they did in England back, I think this was in the mid-90s, they wanted to see if it made a difference how you prune roses as far as the flower quality goes. They're not, you know, not doing research so florists know what they want to do, but just to get roses in the rose garden. So they had 50 and they used the rose called American Beauty, I'm not sure why, but 50 American Beauty roses in one bed, bed right next to it, 50 American Beauty roses here. They had a machine pruning this side, just you know, once every couple of weeks going by and shearing them off. And the best rosarians in England were over here pruning these. And they want to see how many nice looking flowers each side made. So after five years, no difference. <laughs> There's no difference. So they, ran, they said it can't be. So they ran another five years. So they had all the rosarians doing everything that they normally do on rows on this side and a machine just hacking this side. And after 10 years, they had no difference. So they said, okay, apparently it doesn't make any difference. You get rid of the old rows, you know, just get rid of these dead roses and the plant will make good roses. So now, you know, they have instructions for the big rose gardens and how to prune your roses with chainsaws because you know they don't have many volunteers anymore so so what they tell the guys with the chainsaws is okay you go from the bottom up like this to, to prune that rose back with the chainsaw yeah that's what we're taught That's what we're taught. Apparently it makes no difference. <laughs> if you get this, I mean, I mean, aesthetically, your rose plant would probably look better if you pruned it yourself. But apparently it doesn't make much difference on how many roses the plant makes. So, yeah, you can't argue with the research. <laughs> if the machines do just as good a job as the people, you know, what can you say? So anyway, the concept anyway, the more you cut off, the longer it takes to grow the roses back. Now, the one thing about rose we notice is that the older the stem gets, the more petals the rose gets on it. And it gets to the point where 
you don't get the right looking rose anymore if you if you if you have real old stems. So at so what was happening at Huntington Gardens? They had a, a gentleman there for 20 years who didn't believe in pruning back much in the winter. So he wouldn't cut the roses below four feet. He just left everything four foot high because that's how they do in England. For the English roses, David Austin says, don't ever prune my roses. Because the older the stems get, the more petals the flowers get. And that English garden look is what they're going for, which is you know, more or less like, uh, like that. So you get you know, like 100 petals on each rose. And to do that, his roses had to get old and barky. They had to, the stems had to get real thick in order to make the petals like that. Well, in Rose at Huntington Gardens, this guy says, well, I want to do it the same way they do in England. So he didn't prune the roses back, you know, the normal roses, uh, Double Delight, Lincoln Rose. All the roses there start looking like this. <laughs> I mean, I looked at double light go, I've never seen double light looks like that. I mean, they just changed to looking like English roses. 100 petals, uh, couldn't see inside the flowers at all. They didn't look anything like the typical um, hybrid tea, high centered, open flower. They are looking like English roses. So. I don't like that look, I, you know, so I like not to have real old corky bark. So in the winter time or in the spring when I put my rose back, it's nice to clip out at least if you want the modern rose look, clip out the oldest stems in your rose. If you have new stems like this, clip off the older ones and save the new ones. And then the new stems give you that look that we're used to. But if you leave the old stems there, the roses get fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller to the point where you don't recognize them anymore. It's interesting. That's what roses do. So the older the stems get, the more petals they get, the fuller the flowers get. Uh, the more flowers you get, but they don't look like the flowers we're used to. <coughs> <coughs> I couldn't, I would imagine they could. More petals, more fragrance. That might be why the English roses are known for their fragrance. But yeah, he says, don't prune my roses down. Uh, that's David Austin. If you want that English rose look, you just leave the plant intact. And apparently it, it does work. And it will work on American rose too. It's just not the look we wanted. So. Well, the David Austin roses are grown in the U.S. in Tyler, Texas, which is a really hot climate. So, the the problem we had with the David Austin roses were in Eng England's kind of like uh, Canada, weather-wise, like. Northwest Canada, or at least Washington, Seattle, Washington. So their growing season there was a lot shorter. So when they first brought the English roses here, like uh, Graham Thomas rose in England, is a four foot, five foot high rose. Here it was growing 11 feet. And it was just growing these long climber stems. I mean, it was a totally different rose here. So they had to do a makeover. So they had to find out which, so all the English roses that were barely making it in England, not growing at all, suddenly did really well in the U.S. Because <laughs> we have the different weather than they do there. So they had to create a whole new, almost a whole new set of roses for California than they had in England. Because a lot of the roses that were, they were bringing over were huge. We just don't have the same climate. Okay, let me think here. So there are, so if you really get into roses, like we've had customers over the year that had 300, 400 roses. Just, that was just their hobby. 
uh, and they would all own power sprayers to do their spraying. I mean, generally, if you have, say, five rows or less, you can get by with these things. If you've got maybe 10 roses, and you might invest in a, at least a pump type spur so your finger doesn't even get cramped up within a minute or so. But if you've got, say, 20 or more roses, it's almost imperative that if you do want to do any spraying at all, that you use a tank sprayer of some sort. So you pump it up once every minute or so and, and spray. So at the nursery, you know, we take care of as many, I mean, in the old days, when roses were real popular in the 90s, we had like 4,000 roses to take care of. So I would get my backpack sprayer that was a four gallon tank and you pump it up with one arm and spray with the other. And it would take me about eight Phillips to do all the roses. So, so that gets pretty heavy duty if you have a lot of roses to spray. Of course, again, if you just have one or two, you may not have to ever spray them for anything. Uh, I'll mention, well, I forgot to mention. So if you haven't grown roses before, we always get certain pests every year. So you cut your roses back in late winter, early spring, and the, they come out, all the new growth comes out, and you get aphids on them. So aphids are those little green bugs that one aphid lands on the bud, and within a week you got a hundred there. Within two weeks you got three hundred there. They're all there sucking on there and making it a sticky mess. It's difficult to control aphids organically, although I think this stuff may do it. But in my own garden, what I found out is if I just leave them there, the ladybugs will eventually get them all. And then I want the rim about them for the rest of the year. It's actually not the ladybugs. Ladybugs are like the last ones to the game. Uh, there are, uh, the best one is a green maggot. There's a green maggot that eats the aphids uh, 50 a day. It's just a crazy little critter. I mean, it looks horrible. It's called, a, the adult is a surfid fly. A surfid fly is a fly, they sometimes call them bee flies because they look, they're, they're colored like a bee. But you can tell it's not a bee. The eyes are too big and it's only got a couple wings on it. It's also known as a hoverfly, so it, it kind of hovers over your roses looking for these aphids. And then the adult will just do this. It's laying eggs. This just comes down and lays eggs. And then the little maggots hatch out. They slurp up entire aphid colonies. And within a few weeks, no more aphids. And you're clean the rest of the year. So the aphids, uh, if you can just hold your breath for a few weeks, usually the bugs will come and clean them up. Um, sometimes the good bugs don't find them, like on a hibiscus one side, I just said, okay, let's see how long the, the good bugs take to eat, to eat these guys. It took like five months <laughs> for, for, the, for the ladybugs to find the aphids on the hibiscus. But generally on roses, uh, within a few weeks, three weeks or so, uh, or at least by the time the first set of flowers opens, there's no more aphids. The good bugs find them all. Um, and then you just have, then the next one in is your flower thrips. So the flower thrips, I, I hate flower thrips. They're different than the chili thrips. The flower thrips only go after the flower petals, and they only go after light-colored roses. So the red ones, they don't like. But all your light-colored, cream-colored rose petals, you'll notice that all the edges of the petals are brown. Now, a lot of people, it doesn't bother them that the edges of the petals are brown. They open up, they look fine. But the edges of the petals are brown because the thrips get into the flower bud right when they're doing this, get in there and suck on all the petals that they can reach, which are the outer petals. So in order to stop that critter, you have to get the Captain Jacks or the bear and spray just the bud. Once, I would say twice a week. Spray our buds for twice a week for two weeks and you'll kill all the thrips off. Thrips have a life cycle where they're in your buds uh, for um, a week or so. They drop on the ground, pupate in the ground, come back up and start to cycle over again. If you spray your flower buds for two weeks, twice a week, you'll get rid of all the flower thrips in the spring 
and not have to worry about it anymore. But you've got to do it twice a week for two weeks. And that's pretty much the, the nasty bugs in the springtime. I mean, occasionally you'll get caterpillars and grasshoppers that eat the flower buds. Uh, Captain Jacks will take care of that too. And then the chilathrops come in, and then you have to work a little harder. Yes. Yeah, once the sun sets, the bees don't operate after the sun, so it's still light out. And that's when we do all our spring here, too. Uh, plus, we can't spring when there's any customers out, so we're always doing it late in the day. But uh, the only one you have to worry about is if you use neem, if you use an oil spray, it can't be too cold at night when you do it. So oil sprays, um, morning is the best this time of year. So the oils... The way they kill insects is they, the insect can't breathe through the oil, and in five, ten minutes it's pretty much dead. But the leaf can hold its breath a lot longer, but it can't hold it more than a day or so. So, you know, in the old days, I didn't know this, so I sprayed an oil in the evening in December. And by noon the next day, all the leaves on my plant fell off. I'm going, oh, whoop, screw that up. <laughs> and looked at the instructions, yeah. Uh, the oil's got to evaporate within a few hours or else the plant leaves suffocate. And oil doesn't evaporate if it's cold at night. So if it's, you know, so in the morning, this time of year is safer than at night. Uh, and oils don't really kill bees unless you spray it right on the bee. You really can't kill a bee with an oil spray. So they're safer to do it in the day anyway. So oils in the morning, in the cool season, and in night and summer is fine. Another question. Mm -hmm. For, um, for the mildew, I have to spray the solution with salt, but that our breath is like baking stuff. Um, the oil, like, um, is white vinegar, and it's white vinegar. So I mix them together. Yeah, get the vinegar out of there. That's not part of the solution. Yeah, vinegar and baking soda make an explosion. <laughs> yeah, don't don't put the vinegar. The vinegar wasn't part of the solution. Let me get the the product out. Um, <clears throat> So back in the 80s, this formula came out, uh, Cornell University developed it. They said uh, a good, clean oil, not the neem, neem is kind of harsh, but this is a very clean mineral oil. Uh, it was three ounces of this per gallon, one tablespoon of baking soda, and, a, and that's, I think that was it. Because the oil has got a wetting agent in it already. It's already got a little bit of soap in here, so it sticks. And that's all we use in our roses for 10 years. So Once a week, that. we did that. Okay. And it was, we were in heaven. We said, boy, roses are easy. Just spray this once a week. It makes the leaves all shiny, kills the, the bugs, kills the mildew. Uh, the baking soil would kill the mildew. Uh, the oil kills the mildew. The baking soil actually prevents the spores from... Uh, we did in the evening. Well, during, unless it's cold at night, then you have to do it in the morning instead. Because this, yeah, or do it, yeah, do it, say, before four in the afternoon, you're probably okay. Yeah. So, um, right. So a good, clean, what I mean by clean is sulfur free. So the problem with the old oils in the in the old days, and the reason why they only used them in the winter when plants are dormant, is because they had a lot of sulfur in the oil, 
He's, oil and sulfur is a bad combination, burns all the leaves off. So in the 1980s, he came out with these real clean oils <clears throat> with a real low, low sulfur content. Um, so it's like, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's, I think it's three ounces per gallon of water of this and one tablespoon of baking soda. I think that's what we were doing. Might have been two ounces, but uh, oil in one gallon of water. <clears throat> yeah, three ounces of this, one tablespoon of baking soda. There's actually another product in the market um, other than baking soda. Instead of sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda, which is not great for the soil, uh, potassium bicarbonate, which is actually a fertilizer. So there's another product. I don't have it on the shelf right now, I don't think. Potassium bicarbonate, which is supposed to work better. But we used baking soda in those days because we didn't have the other product plus this. And yeah. Beautiful plants until downy mildew showed up in the 1990s, and that really ruined the. Uh, at your own home, this is still fine. This, most homeowners don't get downy mildew because your roses aren't this close together. Oh you know, in, in nurseries, our roses are can to can, and with with them being so close, there's not enough air circulation, and downy mildew, which is a uh, different kind of mildew. You don't even see the, the mildew part of it here because the air is too dry. And if you're on New Jersey, you'd see this gray fuzz over the, all the leaves. Here we get, uh, and it happens when it's cold and wet. So in February or March, all we'll see is a few vague purple blotches on the leaves, and then the leaves turn yellow and they all fall off. It happens on miniature roses a lot because they're so tight. So if you see all your leaves yellow and drop off, that's downy mildew, which is totally different than regular powdery mildew, so downy mildew causes leaves to yellow and fall off. But again, if, you're, if you have regular big roses and they're spaced properly, you may never see this. Uh, but in the nursery industry, boy, everybody was panicking in the 90s because entire fields of canned roses were just turning yellow and falling apart, and no one knew what to do. Um, now the way the the there's a lot of fungicides that work on it, but the least toxic is this one called Garden Foss. It's uh, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. It's essentially a fertilizer. You spray this on them, that really helps with the downy. But again, it's probably something most homeowners don't have to worry about. This product, though, is being used all over the trade because it is fairly safe since it's more or less a fertilizer and it controls root rot on avocados, root rot on citrus, um, downy mildew on impatience, downy mildew on basil, uh, downy mildew on onions. So there's a lot of crops that we're having to use this on because downy has... I don't know where downy is coming from, other parts of the world, but it's hitting everything in the United States. Roses, it's a separate disease that hits impatience. So impatience used to be the number one bedding plant in the U.S. Now they're number 12 because of downy. Uh, basil, it got hit 12 years ago by downy. So if you get your basil leaves wet at night and it's cool, all the leaves turn yellow and fall off, that's downy on basil and onions get it too. So. This has become real popular because it's not a nasty fungicide. It's more or less a fertilizer that helps control the downies. So garden foss, if you have a problem. There's other similar materials of this that control downy too. But garden foss is what we've been selling. Now if you're really into roses, so if you've got 300 roses in your rose garden, then you probably you know use fungicides like Fungimax. There's a lot of heavy-duty fungicides that'll stop all the diseases. But uh, for most homeowners, you don't do this. 
we're getting another one into this this winter for our own use here that we'll have on the shelf other than Fung Fungimax and the rose world is known as Eagle and this other one we're getting in uh, among rose people is known as Banner Max and they're both really uh, potent fungicides for rose disease. Now they have to make new fungicides about every five years because the disease has become immune to them, just the way the world goes. So they, so this is kind of like 12, 15 years on the market and Banner Max may be on the market for 25 years now. The rose uh, fungicides that they created in the 80s don't work well anymore. Uh, so. Okay, I think I covered pretty much everything. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, you can take anything up here.